I am Joe Peroni, and you are listening to the From Grief to Relief show. I am heard live on VegasAllNetRadio.com every Thursday between 2 and 3 p.m. And if you're interested, you can buy my book, From Grief to Relief, at Amazon.com or XLibris.com, X-L-I-B-R-I-S.com. Um, today, I want to uh, welcome back Heidi Mancini as my guest guest host. Hi, everybody. Did you want to say hi to anybody individually? No, I'll just say hi to everybody out in Lockport, New York, my hometown. Hi, everybody. That's because you're afraid to leave someone out. I don't want to leave anybody out, so. <laughs> I was going to do the same thing, and I didn't want to Be leave anybody out, so I'm just going to go with just the way we're doing it. Uh, so I was thinking that uh, because we're a team, and you know I'm Italian, well, you are too, but, and you're a hairdresser, I thought maybe we could like change our name to like the, the Sunny and Hair Show. What do you think? That'd be cool. Like Sonny and Cher. So I get to be the hair. Well, the hair of the well, well obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I liked that show when I was a kid. I used to watch it with my my dad. Actually, it was on Sunday night. Yeah, I used to watch it too with my dad. And Cher used to wear like barely nothing. I think I was like ten years old. I know. And I liked it, but I didn't know why. Well, but I just <laughs> she's a short belly button, so I wonder why. Yeah. Everybody yeah. liked her. She's I, still hot. I, she's how old is she now? Sixty. Me, but she's she still, still looks great. good. She uh, actually, I thought she was Italian, but I don't think no, she is. No, she's Indian. Did she? but she's beautiful. She's. Yeah. You know what's really cool about her? On Long Island, she used to date this guy that used to work at a bagel place for minimum wage. I think that says a lot. As famous as she is, these, what's his name? Rob Camaletti. Camaletti? Yeah, like I think that. she they, cares more about he, substance. He, he was a bagel boy, which I thought was really cool. Anyway, this oh, is... Maybe the, he made good bagels or something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm sure that was worth something. Um, so, do you know how Sonny died? Yeah, I do. Well, you want to tell me? How did he die? He ran into a... Tree. No, he Sne- didn't. Skiing. Yes, he, he did. <laughs> he didn't yes, run he into did. it. He ran into it. It split him in half. He skied into a he tree. Skied. Yeah. Did the tree move in front of him? Or no, but he just skied into he it. He skied into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, what did the tree say after he hit him? I have no idea. <laughs> The tree said, I got you, babe. I got you, babe. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I don't know how good it is. <laughs> it's really good. I got you. Okay. <laughs> Can we turn the song up just for a second? I, I like this song, so. If I could yeah. sing, I would sing it with you. Don't. <laughs> no, actually, you got a good voice, Joe. <laughs> I got you, babe. Can you start singing? Okay. No, I'm not. Okay, we had enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting. <laughs> yeah, you're going to wait a long time. All right. <laughs> so today we have a big show. Um, I want to start out with some current events just because we kind of have to, right, to prove that I'm here or we're live. But then I want to get a little more serious. I want to talk about um, addictions, more specifically uh, drug and alcohol addiction, the term addictive personality, which I don't believe in, uh, theories of change I want to talk about, such as the ever-popular uh, 12-step program. And, of course, and you can expect that you'll be hearing a different perspective um, than the one you've probably heard in the past. But I will give you nothing but the truth. So as usual, uh, keep your mind open and grab the information that you believe will fit you. And if you don't like the rest, just throw it away. Uh, I'm not here to tell you how to think. And I do listen to uh, a lot of radio, and there's a lot of conservative hosts, specifically one who brags about having uh, what he calls ditto heads, listeners who think and act exactly like him. So the way I see it is one million and one people sharing one brain is a waste of a million people. So these conservatives um, who uh, believe in uh, thinking for themselves, supposedly, they actually don't because they're actually believing in um, mental socialism. I think that's what they breed, actually. They, don't, they just don't know it. So obviously I don't value conservative conformist mentality at all. I stand for self-awareness and authenticity. So I expect everybody else out there too not to try to be like us. If you don't like it, just grab what you want and the rest you can just leave. 
Um, I believe every person should bring the best of himself or herself and share it with the community. I believe in strength through individuality and diversity. So this is about shared perspectives and points of interest to further every journey. Uh, sometimes this journey is from grief to relief. And sometimes it's just from uh, your basic needs to your own self-actualization to self-transcendence. So I want to throw out as many seeds as possible to give you more choices. And it's up to you to pick and choose which seeds are worth watering and which ones should just die of loneliness. Don't trust me to make your decision for you. Uh, you need to find your own meaning in life. And that I would suggest um, to find your life's purpose and goals. Uh, you should ask yourself a basic question. What do you want to be remembered for after you leave this world? I'm going to ask you that. What do you think you want to be remembered for? It's a hard question. My kindness. Isn't it? Kindness. Okay. Anything else? I don't know. I never thought about it. Hmm. Now's mm. a good time. Because if you don't have a goal, then you're not really sure what you're doing now to get to it, right? <laughs> well, I want to be remembered for helping people. Feel good. I just don't know what capacity. I do hair, so I know that has some. That helps out people a lot. Helps I think. people a lot. You think it helps out with their self-esteem? Yes, it does. So for me, um, yeah, I don't know why, but I've always been interested in uh, leaving a legacy. I'm always uh, afraid to just leave and then have nobody remember my name. So I'm hoping through the people that I train, uh, books or a book that I wrote, hopefully could help someone. And then they can tell someone else and they can tell somebody else. So that's part of uh, what I like to do. Um, if you don't have any goals which is, seems to be a problem that I see in, in a lot of uh, dysfunction that we see in counseling. If you don't have a goal and no destination, then probably anything else looks inviting to you, and you can go off in a lot of different and wrong directions. Well, I think, I think goals are good, and I think sometimes people don't do their goals, Joe, because of their own insecurities sometimes and their fears and the fact that other people will try to inhibit them from doing those things. Well, you can't. Why would you want to do that? So I think people want to live authentic lives, but sometimes, you know, their means is not maybe where it should be, or they let other people's stuff get in their way. No, I agree. It's, uh, it's, it's tough, because sometimes you have to walk alone in order to get to your goal, and it's hard to know where you want to go. So for me, anyway, I would say um, I was always try to strengthen um, my compass, let's say, so I know exactly where I'm trying to go. All right, so this week, you know what I did? Hmm. I uh, actually have some conservative friends, and so some of the stuff that I say <laughs> is going to come back to bite me in some ways because I actually do have conservative friends, but i got to say it's really, really hard because it's always the same. It's, uh, it's never actually a conversation with conservative people because by definition, they only basically think one you can show them something or have a conversation where you think you're having a dialogue and it's really just this big long monologue they talk and they don't listen to you and yeah. then when they're ready to go again they just start off talking again so it, it's like kind of uh, I would say <laughs> especially this week with the Democratic National Convention most of my Republican friends didn't even watch the convention they don't want to see it that they don't want to know because it might be different from what they're thinking do you get that at work at all oh yeah yeah they we try to keep well, you hear different things going back and forth because of different sides of people. On, but in the salon, we try to keep it, the politics from flaring only because we have uh, seen clients get upset and <laughs> clients start arguing back and forth. It's not a good thing. So, but of course. Yeah, they say that uh, you, you shouldn't want to talk about religion. Sex, politics, and what's the other thing? Religion? Sex, religion, yeah. None of that stuff. You stay away from it because, you know, like I said, I remember last election, one of our nail girls had uh, said to her client, well, I'm voting for this person, and got up on the chair, and that was the <laughs> end of it. She never signed again. As a professional, we're very careful who we speak to. You know your client, who you trust, and who you can confide in and not be judged. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things, too, as a trainer, one-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of the clients do a lot of money, and typically they're Republican. And you got to kind of walk of, I mean, you are feeling like you're degraded, out, listening to, you know, being with them. But then again, you, you don't want to get them too angry either. But, um, yeah, it's really, it's really difficult. Um, 
So when you hear them, though, it's the same person over and over again. Uh, you remember, uh, I don't know, it was back in the 80s. You ever have one of those Teddy Ruspin dolls? I heard of them. You know what it is? It's that doll. You put the cord string in that is getting says like the same thing. I that, had a doll that did. That, yeah. What was her name? Do you remember those dolls, Irma? <laughs> she took hair and you'd pull the back of the string. It's a bit. And, well, I can't remember the other ones. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the way it's like talking to a Republican. They're the same thing. They call, actually, I guess in, uh, on TV, they call them talking points. Yeah. But they all seem to do the same thing. So this is pretty much the talking points that I figured out for this week. About, you know, what they like. So you pull the string, all right? The Republican says, I like to masturbate to Ronald Reagan's speeches. That's that's one. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> I mean, they seem to think he's God, you know, like he was this real conservative guy, yet he raised taxes 11 times and, you know, he did all these other things. So, <laughs> all right. And then they say this, rich people deserve to pay less taxes because they're the job creators. You know, I hear that one. And this one I hear, heard all week. Liberals don't value hard work or competition and want to punish success. See, now, that one bothers me. Yeah. Well, they all bother me. Because <laughs> that stuff is so not true. All it is is trying to be divisive and try to put people down. It makes no sense. So I thought about this. The job creators are the customers, right? Yes. I mean, you have a business, I have a business. You're not the job creator. You couldn't hire hairdressers unless you had more clients. Right? Right. And I'm a personal trainer. I can't hire other trainers underneath me unless I had a huge amount of clients that I couldn't get to. Exactly. So I'm not the job creator. It's the clients of the job creators. So I don't understand why they don't understand that it's cyclical. Again, it goes back to the thought that they think they do everything. And it takes a lot of help. Um, and here's something else I was thinking of. This competitive thing. I was thinking, you know... It's such. It's not true. First of all, since the first day I was born, I, I was always competitive. Uh, whether it's bodybuilding, uh, college, I'm competitive. And here's one for you. <laughs> you know what a circle jerk is? Somebody said that today to me about <laughs> politics, if you can believe it. And they said it's like a big circle jerk. But, and I was like, really? I go, what is that? <laughs> I was trying, <laughs> and it was. I think it's what you're going to say it is. Okay, make it more literal. It would be a bunch of guys in a circle, right? In a circle jerk, right? It would be master. Yeah. Let's see who could have an orgasm first. Okay. Okay, I'm going to say, if I, was, if, I, if I was in one, I am so competitive, I would come in first, third, and fifth out of a field of ten. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you get it? I get it. <laughs> All right. Anyway. I was so, just surprised to hear a girl say that. Because we were just talking about that a few days ago. That's what and girls well, talk about. No, she so said long. the political arena right now is like a circle jerk, and I cr I cracked up and I said you're referring that there's a sexual. She said that's exactly what I'm saying. She goes, it's disgusting. So <laughs> anyway, that's the second time in one week I've heard that. Now it'll be three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I was thinking about this too. The difference between a liberal and a conservative. All right, when a liberal such as myself climbs the ladder of opportunity. He or she wants others to climb up the ladder as well. When a conservative climbs the ladder of opportunity, they pull the ladder up as fast as they can, and they don't give credit to the people who actually put the ladder there in the first place. Right? Mm -hmm. That is why they always favor slashing student loans. If it was up, for them, up to them, nobody else would go to college, except for maybe their kids, because they have enough money to pay for their kids, but they don't want the kids to actually have any competition. That's true. So a note to conservatives, you did not do it all by yourself. If you were as religious as you say you are, you would understand the phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. Obviously, altruism doesn't run through your blood, but I do know that narcissism does. So um, how do you know that someone is a Republican narcissist? I don't know. Yeah. When they have an orgasm, they yell out their own name. <laughs> Think about Jeez. it. <laughs> oh, God. How do you circumcise a Republican from down south? I don't know. Kick his sister in the back of the head. Oh. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. <laughs> I'm not looking for the southern vote here. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Note to Republicans. You are not conceived by yourself. You are not born by yourself. You did not change your own diapers. I could go on all day. 
And if you played football against me way back when, I'm sure the multiple concussions I would have given you, that would have also altered the trajectory of your life. Sometimes there's a certain amount of luck. Now, success um, does take hard work. And as a bodybuilder, I do know that. Success also requires risk taking. And as a business owner, I know that too. You know that too, That's right? That's true, yeah. But it also takes some luck and the help of others. If you don't think so, that luck has something to do with this, what I'll do, I'll, I'll invite you to meet some of the kids that I work with every week. Would you like to be bor born, not your fault, born with alcohol syndrome? Born mentally challenged. How about live in five foster homes by the time you're 15 years old? How about abandoned at birth? So as you see, there but for the grace of God go, you forgot that part too. I'm sure you did. So you Pollyanna and leave beaver type publicans, you need to learn a little bit of humility and put yourself in somebody else's shoes for once. The actual word is called empathy, but I said the definition first because I have no faith that you actually know what that word means. You think they know what that word means? No. What do you call a conservative with a heart? I have no idea. A surgeon. A <laughs> I mean, surgeon. That's the, only, the only, that's the only thing they know how to work. You know, they don't know how to work it from the other way. Anyway. All right. Um, hey, Willard. I'm going to call him Willard. That's his real name. Mitt Romney. No one ever has begrudged you for your success. You did really good. And it looks like you have a, an excellent family. No one would say any, anything other than that. But you need to admit your birth privilege. You were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, and you can't say you hit a home run by yourself when you popped out of a vagina base. Not everyone does. Not everyone is even on the field. Not everyone is even in the stadium. Just acknowledge that. That would be a good thing. Nobody wants to steal your money. They just want to see a little humility. Just a question. Why do you think Mitt Romney would be really good at doing laundry? I have no idea. Because he's an expert at separating the whites from the colors. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Did, did you know that they, they just had a, a, a survey and they said 94% uh, of black people want to vote for Obama and 0% want to vote for Romney. The other 6%, I don't know where they went, but... 90 to zero not one no, percent that's crazy, that's well, crazy. Know. all right so enough of the uh current events uh we will be right back after this song by amy winehouse ask yourself while you're listening to this song if you believe she died because of drugs and uh, we'll be right back no, no, no. Yes, I've been black, but when I come back, you're oh, no, no, no. I ain't got the time. Now, if my daddy thinks I'm fine, just try to make me go to rehab. I won't go, go, go. I'd rather be at home with the rain. I ain't got 70 days Cause there's nothing, there's nothing you can teach me That I can learn from Mr. Hathaway I didn't get a lot in class But I know I will Try to make me go to rehab I said no, no, no Yes, I've been black But when I come back You're oh, no, no, no I ain't got the time And if my daddy thinks I'm fine Just try to make me go to rehab I won't go, go, go The man said a wife yeah, thank you, he yeah. I said, I got no idea, yeah. Said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my baby. So I always keep a 
bartender on there. He said, I just think you're the prayers. And this me, hey, baby, and the rays. Tried to make me come to rehab. I said, no, no, no. Yes, I've been black, but when I come back, you're no, no, no. I don't never want to drink again. To make me go to rehab, I say, and no, no, no. Yes, I've been glad, but when I come back, you're no, no, no. I ain't got the time. I help my daddy since I'm fine. Just try to make me go to rehab, I go, 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 go. I am Joe Peroni, and you are listening to the From Grief to Relief show. I'm heard live on VegasAllNetRadio.com every Thursday between 2 and 3 p.m. Um, that was Amy Winehouse. And the last question to you was, is, do you believe she died of drugs? I'll give you my answer. From a human perspective, Amy Winehouse died because she didn't love herself, and she felt an incredible amount of inner pain. The more fame and fortune she acquired, the more she felt unworthy. And uh, current rehab um, is concerned with symptom management at the expense of root cause. And it certainly didn't do her any favors, including uh, mentioning by name. I hear people like Dr. Drew always trying to come across as an expert saying that she's been fighting alcohol her whole life and this and this. Yeah, I get it. But she's fighting a lot more than alcohol. I mean, I'll ask Heidi this. Um, what do you think would happen if you could wave a magic wand and make every drop of alcohol on the planet disappear? Would there be no more alcoholics? Would there be no more alcoholics if there's no more alcohol? Yeah, there, there I mean, be if alcoholics, they alcoholics, there, there wouldn't be any. Yeah, if they had an alcohol, if they had an alcohol problem, and so you just go, okay, wave a magic wand, and all the alcohol on the is gone because they have an alcohol problem. Just take it away. There won't be any more alcoholics. Well, then what will they be? There'll be a, a lot of people with a lot of inner pain still trying to alter their reality, and with what would something. happen? So then, take away all the drugs. Are they healthy and happy now? No. Then what do they do? In other words, it's not a drug problem. It's an it's alcohol self, problem. It's a selfish problem. What they do is they would get to a point where they're just hitting their head against a wall trying to stop whatever pain they have. So that's my issue with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. like if you have somebody out in the cold and they're freezing, they have a heavy jacket on. They, they go and wear a heavy jacket because they're cold. And you go over to them and take the jacket off. Did you help them? No. no, they're still cold. You got to take the people out of the cold. Exactly. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's where the problem is. It's the root cause. I'll probably end up saying this 20 times today, and I'll probably bore everybody with saying it. But somebody needs to say it because when I show you these numbers here, you'll know why. <laughs> well, the thing is that they, if the problem is that people are treating symptoms and not the cause, why people are doing what they're doing, why do they continue to use the same type of therapy that they used? I don't even know, 100 years ago maybe, that doesn't work. They know it doesn't work, but they have statistics that they have the recovery for the 12-step program, which is not very successful. You want me to give you a reason? Yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that, like, that make a lot of money off of other people's pain. And there's a lot of money in curing the, in trying to shut down the symptoms and not a lot of money in getting rid of the cause that's where it is so if you can keep people sick there you you have a customer for life 
that that's a big part of it. The other part of it is in uh, mental health. It's not the uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors that run the program. It's the insurance companies that run the program. They tell you they're going to pay for. So typically they only pay, let, let's say, five sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy. Which is, I, I said every week, it, it, it's meant to make animals perform behaviors. It's not meant for human beings. So basically cognitive therapy is the way you, you teach people ABCs. You give them direction on what they should do. Well, it's most people don't know what cognitive therapy is. It, well, it's exactly what you said it is. You got an A, a B, and a C. You've got so if you do this, this, and this, this is what you're, this is what this is what should happen. Right, and that's it, what they leave the office with. You have a trigger, and then you behavior, and you have a consequence. Say, okay, do you drinking. Okay, I do. What do you feel like drinking? Well, I feel like drinking at night. Okay, well, then what do you do about it? It's nighttime. <laughs> go to sleep yeah. or they'll say what triggers me what triggers me is when I have an argument with my girlfriend okay so then don't argue with your girlfriend get rid of your girl or <laughs> what triggers you is traffic you know that gets stressed you get stressed you want to drink okay so take a wrap leave 20 minutes early that makes a little bit of sense but here's the problem the trigger what if the trigger is you what if it's your lack of self-esteem? Then how do you stop the trigger from causing you to make a bad choice to a bad behavior, such as drinking? If you inside do not like yourself, and I'm not saying it's that person's fault. You know, a lot of people have been abused in these types of things, and they buy into even verbal abuse about themselves, and they feel like they're less than. Mm -hmm. They dislike themselves. They feel like they're incompetent. That is a huge trigger. That is a trigger that you need some serious counseling for. And then just to say to somebody, that's your trigger, avoid the trigger, and then you'll stop the behavior. That's ridiculous. So therapy should be approached more in a, um, I don't know what I was just going to say to you, Joe. Inside out. Inside out. That's what I was going to say. The self-esteem. Um, treating somebody's self-esteem first and, and helping them feel better that they can accomplish things and that they can um, have their goals, as you said before earlier right. in the show. And do you um, do you like yourself? Yes. Do you like your life? Yes. Do you love your work? Yes. What would stop you right now from drinking a bottle of wine before you go back to work? Because I have to go back to work, and I know. Right. No, but that's a good point. Because yeah. you have to go. Because you value your work. Right. I you value your clientele, and you told me before, going back to the beginning, you want to be remembered for helping people. Right. Are you going to do that when you're wasted on the couch at home while your clients are waiting for you? No. You're not going to have a business. So you have to have self-esteem in yourself. You have to care enough about your life. Going back to. What is your life's purpose? What's your life's meaning? All of these things are very inward. It's not triggered by small little things out in the real world. It's huge things inside your inner universe. Mm -hmm. They don't understand this. And you could say I'm wrong. Go well, ahead, I think tell the me counselors, <laughs> I, you know, I think the counselors understand this. Um, we talked before you said about existential ther um, counseling and cognitive. And I think that counselors understand that. I think, like you said before, there's an arena of money issues. And the fact is, is how do you take a, an adult after so many years of them abusing themselves and then from a child, because I'm sure all these things happen in our childhood. Right. So it seems like it would be a lot more work. It does take a lot of work. Just a lot. say, here's a symptom, go home and write for a couple hours. You're right. It takes it takes time, and it takes a lot more than just the five sessions sometimes that uh, insurance companies want to pay for. You know, that's for sure. And the other thing that you actually alluded to it, so I'm going to say it just in case somebody's out there, is if somebody is hooked on drugs or they've been drinking alcohol, I understand that you, in order to detox, that is a medical situation. So in that sense, I would say the drug is the problem. So let, let me define that. Because if some physically addicted, yes, that the drug is the mm -hmm. problem. I, I want to make sure that because the thing I is, is that. even with cigarette smoking, um, they tell people you're addicted to the nicotine. So if you drill that in somebody's head long enough, and they want to give up this habit, they've been told you're addicted. You're in you step program. The first thing they say is you're powerless. 
So if you put that negative thought in a person's head and you say, well, you're an addict, you're addicted to this nicotine that's in a cigarette, you're kind of already setting a person up for failure because they've already got this negati- negative thing in their head. Well, if your parents told you from the day you were born you're powerless, do you think you this would be... This is an be- excuse to not get better because you could say, well, I can't give this up because they say I can't. Right. And... I mean, look at your whole life, though. Do, do you think you would have been good at school? Do you think you would have had friends? Do you think you would be a good mother and a hairdresser and all the things you are if you were told that you're powerless and you have no control over no. your life? You wouldn't. So no. that's so. these things are all lies, but we're going to get into that a little bit more, too. Um, let me just put in some numbers here so you can see what we're talking about, uh, about the death and destruction caused by... Uh, people who are dependent on drugs and alcohol in america they say about 15 percent of people are alcoholics and about 51 percent say they're regular drinkers which of course they could so that the percentage of alcoholics actually could be higher now there's 140,000 drug and alcohol related deaths per year and that doesn't include people who are injured or um destruction of families you know that that's so this is just the, the tip of the iceberg here. And I'm not including cigarettes, by the way. So the number really doesn't mean anything to anybody. It's 140,000. So I found out a way to make it mean something to you. I looked up the amount of people who died in World War II. And that number is 420,000. But here's where the numbers get crazy. World War II lasted six years and one day. So you would have to time the drugs and alcohol related deaths by six to come up with the number. And the number is 840,000. So double the amount of people die in this country due to drugs and alcohol than died in World War II when people were actually trying to kill people. So you really don't have to worry about terrorists or foreign powers taking us over. All you got to do is go to a bar. You know, we're, we're killing ourselves. I hate to be the one to tell you that, mm-hmm. but that's the, the numbers just, they line up. That's what they are. And here's where we are today in terms of a society of how we deal with it. We have a model whereby most, most people consider drug dependency to be a disease. We believe that people are born with addictive personalities. And 95% of people uh, with the um, drug and alcohol problem are sent to 12-step programs. And they consider that's the best theory of change. And we have licensed alcohol and drug counselors, which are trained and paid to treat the, I'm going to do this in air quotes, i got to say it because you can't see me, alcohol and drug problem. Because I think we figured that out. It's not an alcohol and drug problem. So let me do some attacking here. Um, or just nicely uh, dis- their supposed truths. Addictive personalities. I can't tell you how many times I've had a client come to me and you know, Joe, I have an addictive personality. Uh, I do alcohol, I do marijuana, I do this, I do this, I do that. Okay, here's my first question. Are you addicted to holding the hand of a child, cancer patient, while they receive chemotherapy? Then they look at me really weird. Question number two. Do you, or are you addicted to playing the harp at your local hospice so people can die peacefully? Of course, they say, they look at me weird. Then I hit them with the last one. Have you ever been addicted to going to your local hospital and held a crack baby? And they look and they go, they don't understand. And that's because we have this American thought. Let me, uh, let me define this a little bit. The answer to all these questions that most people that I just gave you, most of people, or all people will say no. You know why? Because they're only addicted or participating in self-destructive and self-loathing behaviors, which is also a little bit of a lie because they kill other people. So it's world destructive. So if your inner pain kills one of my loved ones, I'm not very happy. Fix the problem. Mm -hmm. You can just as easily be addicted to something that helps you. Like working out? like working out have a conscious decision to do something good for yourself you can enjoy self-care go get a manicure go get a massage do something for yourself go get an education you have a choice joe you promised me a foot massage last week yeah i did i still owe you one don't i <laughs> <laughs> speaking of the spa a little behind. i just remembered that <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, let me get back to this. Uh, here's some more truth for you. Let me attack this whole um, alcohol and drug abuse thing. I, I don't like the term. I'll ask you this question. If you took a frying pan and whacked your child over the head with it, what is it called? Physical abuse. Child abuse, child right? Abuse, you hit your yeah. kid over the head. All right, so if you were married and took a frying pan and hit your spouse over the head, what is it called? Spousal abuse. Spousal abuse. So what if you took the frying pan and hit yourself over the head? What is it called? Self-abuse. Self-abuse, right. So those are all the right answers. You mm -hmm. would have child abuse, spousal abuse, and self-abuse. Self okay, take the frying pan out of the situation now. Let's use the word alcohol. If you abuse yourself with alcohol, is it called self-abuse? No. No, it's called alcohol abuse. Let's get something straight. Alcohol is not being abused. It's the person who's being abused. When you depersonalize and you put the problem on the substance rather than the person, it's an, a move to deny the individual's responsibility and free will. Substance abuse is a symptom, not the cause. The person has the problem, not the drug. The person has a pain problem, typically an inner pain problem. It could be physical, but typically an inner pain problem. Well. The not so much, but physical part of pain too. Don't you, some people do get addicted to certain substances because of illness or injuries? Yes. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I believe that. But here's the other thing: when someone has like a really bad back injury, and it's there's nothing the doctors can do. There's no surgery. Let's say they're mm -hmm. they're in pain all the time. In my mind, they're not addicted to drugs. They're addicted to feeling better and not being debilitated. True. You know, I mean, yes, the drug can be a problem down the line because it can destroy your liver and kidneys. I get that. But I would not necessarily call them a drug addict like they have a problem with the drug. If they can't cope in their life because their pain is so bad in their back they can't walk, I, I'm not saying I give them a free pass. But I don't necessarily call it. It's not, I, don't, I don't believe that's the same thing. I believe that they're just trying to stop some physical pain so they can get through the day. Which is all... Hmm. Well, because you hear people through the day say that they got addicted to prescription painkillers. Right, and they continue to take them after the pain right. is gone. So okay, that's, really that's different. okay. Now okay. that's different. Yeah, yeah, then then I'll agree with you there, hundred percent. Because f some physical pain, you, unfortunately, it will it can never get better. You know that's that true. that's the reality of life there too. So I would say um, it's a coping problem. Um, liquid in a bottle on a shelf in some random store does not have magical powers over a human's life. The only power it has is the power given to it by a misguided, a misguided person. So you can say there's two kinds of people, responsible and irresponsible. An irresponsible person's best attempt at coping is to temporarily alter his or her perception of reality. The problem is that these people, unfortunately, they haven't yet found the strength to stop the self-loathing behaviors. They could do something that's self-loving. That's, that, that's the other side of the coin. But um, here's something else. Alcohol in the bloodstream doesn't cause the body to crave more. Like, like they try to say it's a disease. Here's something that you'll probably laugh at, but you've got to be okay with me saying it because this is with a girlfriend a long time ago. Um, I didn't know that she was on this 12-step program. And she had this um, charm, I think you call it, had a number on it. I don't know what the number was. Never bothered to ask, but then I did. And it's like how many years clean she was. And I didn't know that at the time. I learned it afterwards. But let mm -hmm. me say this. Um, she slept over my house two days in a row. During that time, you know, she was taking a shower and all that kind of thing. And I had Listerine, right? Now, you would think that that's not a big deal. But when I learned that she had a disease of alcoholism, I thought I was the worst person on the face of the planet. I thought I had endangered her in a way that might kill her. I thought I hurt her. Now, you're going to laugh at me, right? Because you don't know what I'm talking about. Let me say it this way. If a person has a disease and alcohol touches their bloodstream, it should cause a reaction, should it not? You would think so, yeah. Right. Well, Listerine has like 25% alcohol in it. And she was using my Listerine multiple times per day. And I was under the impression that I was going to make her, you know, relapse and possibly die. 
I, I did not know that. So I bought into this BS a long time ago, but it's true. She also liked vanilla cake now and then, too, and I can tell you that's also 20% alcohol and vanilla extract. So these things don't work. It's not true. Well, one thing I will say about that is that drinking, the, the feeling of, that's what people like. You, right. Have you ever drank? Um, have you ever got drunk? Not really. A long time ago. Okay. Yeah, honestly. But I think that's what people get. They like the feeling of what the drug or what the alcohol does, too. It's like a temporary escape from their reality, whatever it is. Right. And I could see you doing it for fun and then. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about, um, you could say I might sound a little harsh, right? Yeah, I mean, you do. Well, that could be. I mean, someone could see that. But see, so you know why I'm <laughs> harsh? Because more people die of alcohol and drugs than did in, in World War II. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm on the right side here. Yeah, like, you are. Like, I could be a jerk right now, but I'm also the one who's trying to help. And the person that I'm helping might be me and it might be you. You know, so... Well, I think the traditional ways that people are treating people, the therapists, that need to change because it seems that they're using old techniques that don't work. And it almost pulls, and that it enables them. Right, and I think part of that, as you said, symptom management programs are not prevalent. They are the only way, you know, like pretty much the only way in counseling mm -hmm. right now. But um, they don't work, and it works for the insurance companies. So the other thing I was thinking of, too, is when you say that, you know what one of the other problems is? Mm -hmm. you, know who, you know who's affected by drugs and alcohol? Who? Counselors. Right? The people that are counseling are at the same percentage of drug and alcohol abuse as the people they're counseling. So, obviously, they're going to have a little more empathy in certain things than they should. Well, I don't know what the statistics on that are, but I know that I've, I, the experience I've had with counselors and stuff, they're, sometimes they got a lot of problems, too, yeah, <laughs> that and, they're dealing with. You know, let's, let's go down the, you know, down the whole line that has to deal with these. Uh, judges, juries doctors mm -hmm. so all of them have this problem so there's not going to be too many people that stand above the crowd and say listen this is wrong so there's definitely more than enough uh, minimalization justification and denial to keep america in, cr in crisis like what for forever until the end of time so uh, yeah i mean so that's just some of the stuff i was thinking about um what i want to do is i'm going to go over this 12-step program really quick and just to pull out some stuff you already know how we feel about it here but uh you know what the success rate is in the 12-step program? No. It's 5%, which is horrible. Now, here's the, uh, here's, it gets worse. Okay, it, it, they consider the, sex ra the success rate, the sex rate, the success rate to be 5%. But they also say that 5% would have quit on their own just because they get sick and tired of watching their friends die. So in that sense, the success rate is zero gets worse the success rate is less than zero because they have this cult-like status where god comes first or so and your your um aa members come first or second like right in there mm -hmm. and then your family is third so how many families does this break up because supposedly a an aa member can understand you better than your own husband or wife so it destroys family so the percentage is, is even lower let me make it even worse for you they even say they don't have a success rate because they say you'll always be, even if you don't drink or drugs, you're always in recovery. So the, the success rate is zero or less than zero. They tell you right off. You're not here's, better. Yeah, here's uh, number one. Let me just go over this. The first step, we admitted that we're powerless. Okay, we talked about that, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, that's ridiculous. It takes a person's choice to sit in personal responsibility. But I love this first one. It says that... We admitted powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Let's get this straight. Their life was unmanageable. That's why they turned to alcohol as a coping strategy. Alcohol didn't make their life unmanageable. They were in a situation where their life was unmanageable, turned to alcohol, and then they blamed the alcohol instead of fixing their life. That's the truth. I'm not saying it's, it's easy to fix your life, but you have to at least find the target. Number two, power greater than ourselves could restore us to uh, sanity. First of all, when you think that something's greater than yourself and you have no accountability, there's no autonomy for the, the client, it means that you'll never have self-esteem because you don't have a reasonable expectation that you can do it by yourself, which is the whole basis of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to stop at those two there because it just gets worse from there. Um, oh, let me just do this real quick. Make believe you you just walked into an AA meeting. What are you told to do? Just say, hi, my name hi, is. Hi, my name is Heidi. And? And I'm an alcoholic. Right. Now, remember we talked about meaning and purpose in your life? Mm-hmm. Should I make you say that you're an alcoholic? Is that how I'm going to help you? How about you say you are a mother, you're a, a hairdresser, you're a great human being, but sometimes I have a problem with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Which one makes you feel better? The second one. Right. Do you want to be known as an alcoholic? Or do you no. want to be known as a person who has a problem with alcohol, but is still a great person who deserves respect? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think I made my point. Um, we're going to be right back after this song by a French, uh, I hope I can pronounce this right, uh, Gerald de Palmas. It's called uh, Addicted to Love. You've heard the song, but you haven't heard this version. I'm playing the song because, number one, you haven't heard it before. And number two, because you can be addicted to something good. This is Joseph Peroni, and you're back listening to the From Grief to Relief show. We don't have much time left, so I'm going to try to um, give you a little bit more information before we go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about negative addiction, um, because there might be a question out there. Um, I was thinking about this. Um, Why do addicts have so much energy to sustain a life of drugs, but they don't seem to have enough energy to look for love or meaning? I think we kind of touched on that. Self-esteem thing. They don't think they're good enough. You, you actually you have it um, let me say that this is one of the reasons why okay I know it's a complicated subject but I'm gonna take it from here because drugs don't say no drugs don't reject you and drugs don't judge and drugs don't abandon you as long as you have enough money right mm-hmm. so self-esteem if it's too low you are not gonna be able to handle possible rejection from a human being Now, here is to say this part, because I know there's a lot of loving parents out there. But the problem for those who love a person with self-esteem, this, the more you try to help, 
And the more to love these people, the worse they feel because they don't feel worthy of the love you give them. And they feel inside that they will disappoint you and, and themselves and around them. So they just kind of give up. So it's a very tough situation. So let me finish this real quick with some uh, treatment type of things we can look for here. The person needs to fill what we call the exit act means meaninglessness. You need to fill that with something. You have not connected yet with who you are and what place you have in this world. You need to know the answer to who are you and what difference are you going to make in this world. So find meaning and find purpose in your life. Better yet, also end with that find positive addiction. Improve your self-esteem. Do not live in the past or only long enough to learn from mistakes or from the stupid things that other people may have done to you or look back on some maybe some past triumphs and things that you have done well because you can continue to do well like I always said move on no improve on yes and also learn to laugh at yourself you have to have a sense of humor too I want to play this last song here um, it's called a strange love addiction it's by a band called the supreme beings of leisure i hope i've been of some service to you and before the sun sets on your life let it be said that you made a difference my name is joe peroni heidi mancini and we will see you next week thank you expressed on this program were those of the hosts and guests and did not necessarily reflect those of Vegas All Net Radio, its affiliates, or its parent company.